Hi, and welcome to a, another lecture in Poetics Forms class. Um, got my glass of wine. It's about midnight, so it seemed like a good time to um, to talk about Poetic Forms again. Um, I know y'all have an assignment coming up, and uh, the assignment is to write a poem in a complex form. That was include Sestinas, which I sent you a couple examples of, Villanelles, and I also said that you might consider any of the other stanzaic forms that Paul Fussell mentions in his chapter on English stanzas um, in his book that you have been looking at. Um, that would include Rhyme Royal, ballad stanza, common meter, um, there are a bunch of them that he, he talks about. Um, so when you turn your poem in, and if you opt for one of those, just make a note of which one you're, you're doing so that I can keep track. I also said that if you wanted to try to write a different kind of sonnet from the sonnet you wrote last week, that'll work too. So today what I want to talk about um, are three poems. Um, one Villanelle, one Sestina, and um, one poem in common meter. So I'll begin by reasserting something. Last time we talked, we were looking at English sonnets and Italian sonnets. And I was trying to communicate the idea that um, whereas, you know, with free verse, we often get that sense of um, inevitability, I think I called it, um, that feeling of listening in, listening in on someone thinking for a little while, the poem enacting that thought on the page, until somehow we get booted out of the mind of the person whose thoughts we're listening in on, and find ourselves in the position of trying to understand what it was we just heard. Um, Sonnets, I said, were closed forms. That is, um, they inevitably end on the 140th syllable if you're doing it right. Um, or, you know, as long as you're not writing a curdle sonnet or something. And um, they have very, very um, prescribed architectures. We said that the English sonnet has um, four sections, three quatrains and a couplet. And in that way, it is perfectly suited to building an argument, we said, going from point to point to point, and then twisting the argument or undercutting the argument or changing the terms, or as I think I said, then stabbing you in the stomach. Um, and we said that an Italian sonnet begins with an octave, an eight-line stanza, and then offers us a sestet, a uh, six-line stanza, and it's good for very different kind of thinking. A two-part poem is necessarily going to think differently from a four-part poem. And here we say that the poem, the ideal Italian sound, often offers us a thought and then offers a counterpoint. Or it asks a question and then answers a question. So the two-part architecture is different from the four-part architecture and that dictates exactly how the poem appears to be thinking to us or how it appears to be speaking, what kind of arguments it can make and what kind of arguments it can't make. For instance, I've never read a good narrative sonnet. It just, it just doesn't really work. Um, sonnets aren't good at being narrative. Sonnets are good at being meditative. Um, ditto with these next two that we're going to look at here, the uh, Sestina and the Villanelle. I sent you all a little um, plan for how a Sestina works. It's incredibly complicated. Um, basically, I'm just going to tell you again roughly how it works, but consult your sheet that I emailed you if, before you try to write one of these things. They are famously the most difficult verse form in the English language to write. They didn't originate with the English language. They originated with the Italian language. So maybe that's got something to do with it, but I doubt it. Basically, the Sestina works like this. You're going to have um six six line stanzas six six line stanzas if you're going to be strict about it 
each of those lines is going to be an iambic pentameter, but you don't have to be. The Bishop poem I, I gave you is actually largely iambic tetrameter. Most of the good sestinas I read, which are not very many, are in rhythmic but not metered uh, lines. These six lines are going to have six end words. We'll call those end words, end word one, two, three, four, five, and six. Once you've picked your end words in your first stanza, you are wedded to them. It's like a huge game of Jenga. You can't, you can't, you can't start messing around once you've picked your six end words. Because those end words are going to repeat as the end words of every single stanza in the poem. So if your end words are moon, sky, ball, fire hydrant, french fry, and lamp, you're stuck with those end words from your first stanza as end words throughout the entire poem in an incredibly planned out repetitive structure. This is how it works. The last end word of stanza one, very final end word in line six of stanza one, becomes the first end word of stanza two. The first end word of stanza one, that is the very first one, line one of stanza one, becomes the second end word of stanza two. The second to last end word of stanza one becomes the third end word of stanza two. The second end word of stanza one becomes the fourth. The third from last becomes the fifth and the third, the sixth. I know this sounds really complicated, but you can get the hang of it and look at the map I sent you. And you'll see that after a while, it begins to resemble a shelling structure, going from lowest to highest, second lowest to second highest, third lowest to third highest, and that predicts the next stanza. That's how it's always gonna work throughout the poem. But Paul, you're gonna repeat that exercise with the end words of the stanza preceding the stanza that you're working on all the way through till you get the last of your six line stanzas okay that's really complicated and what this basically means is that once you write your first stanza you're going to have to keep hitting those end words perfectly all the way through in this pre-formatted order at the very end you're going to have the tercet and if you didn't think this was challenging enough the tercet makes it even more challenging because in the tercet you have three lines Ideally, you have iambic pentameter, that is, you've got 30 syllables, and you have to hit, fit all six end words into those three lines. One end word has to be in the middle of the first line, and the next has to be the last. Another end word has to be the middle of line two of the three line ending tercet, and then the last line, and then the middle, and then the last. So all those end words have to come real close together in the end. They've been dancing for a while sort of far apart. Now they're jammed up together. That final section is called the envoy, and it should probably resemble, um, in some ways, the workings of the couplet that comes at the end of the English sonnet. <sighs> okay. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot to say. I think the thing to remember about Sestinas is this. There are a few sort of hints, and then we're going to look at one. Um, hint number one. A sestina, like a sonnet, participates in its own architecture. That is, there are certain kinds of thinking that are available for sestinas that are probably not available for sonnets, right? Totally different architecture, different kind of thinking. But as with sonnets, man, don't try to write a narrative sestina. It's just not going to work. It's really hard to get narrative storytelling into a sestina because you have to keep on hitting those n-words and you hit those n-words they just pull you back from the story i mean the whole point of the sestina is you may be progressing down the page with your eyes as you read the thing but really the poem is probably not progressing through time in that way i like to think this though there is something diabolical about a sestina it keeps on returning to those words over and over and over again in this incredibly complex dance. And in that way, there's something about the Sestina that suggests to me an obsessive mind 
a mind that's going around in circles, like the Sistina seems to go around in circles, that keeps on coming back to the same images and the same ideas over and over again. We said at the very beginning of the class that all poetry has at its fundamental core repetition, but the Sistina's repetition is in some ways insane. So I think when you're thinking about what to write your Sistina about, begin from a position maybe of obsession or of obsess obsessiveness or of something that might keep a mind turning around and around a subject. I think you'll have much more productivity there than if you think, well, what kind of story can I tell? Or what happened in my past that I can sort of, you know, talk about in a reasonable, logical way? It's just not gonna work that way. I'm gonna read that. Well, the other, the other clues I've learned about Sestinas are these. Your end words should be thematic, right? You're going to keep returning to them. If your end words are not thematic to the poem, you're going to have a really hard time um, using them. Your end words should be interesting. If your end words are the, uh, then, or, and, or whatever, you're going to have a really boring, you're going to have a really boring Sestina. Um, you want to keep the end words interesting. Another thing to do is to make the end words um, um, manipulatable, right? Uh, I think it's good to have end words from which you can draw multiple meanings. I have a friend who wrote a Sestina once where he used the word blue, B-L-U-E, as an end word, rightly realizing that it's interesting to use a color as an end word because it tends to color the poem. At the same time, he got playful and used the word blue, B-L-E-W, a couple times too. It sounded the same. I don't know if you think that's cheating. I thought it was clever. Um, I'm going to read you a Sestina by Elizabeth Bishop, um, and we can listen to it. This Sestina was originally called Early Sorrow um, when she first wrote it, but then before she published it, she deleted that title and offered us just the title, Sestina. Um, but Early Sorrow, I think, does give us something to, to think about in the background of this poem as we read it. Sestina. And before I read it, I'm going to tell you the end words are house, grandmother, child, stove, almanac, and tears. September rain falls on the house. In the failing light, the old grandmother sits in the kitchen with the child beside the little marble stove, reading the jokes from the almanac, laughing and talking to hide her tears. She thinks that her equinoctial tears and the rain that beats on the roof of the house were both foretold by the almanac, but only known to a grandmother. The iron kettle sings on the stove. She cuts some bread and says to the child, it's time for tea now. But the child is watching the tea kettle's small hard tears dance like mad on the hot black stove. The way the rain must dance on the house, tidying up, the old grandmother hangs up the clever almanac on its string. Bird-like, the almanac hovers half open above the child, hovers above the old grandmother and her teacup full of dark brown tears. She shivers and says she thinks the house feels chilly and puts more wood on the stove. It was to be, says the marble stove. I know what I know, says the almanac. With crayons, the child draws a rigid house in a winding pathway. Then the child puts in a man with buttons like tears and shows it proudly to the grandmother. But secretly, while the grandmother busies herself about the stove, little moons fall down like tears for between the pages of the almanac. Into the flower bed, the child is carefully placed in the front of the house. Time to plant tears, says the almanac. The grandmother sings to the marvelous stove. The child draws another inscrutable house. It's a gorgeous poem and an elusive one. It's hard to look into this poem. We've looked into others in this class and and argued about what 
what its meanings are, what its hidden and not so hidden meanings are, and what the tensions are that are at work in it. Instead, it seems to live inside the memory of a little girl um, who's brought to us in the third person and who sits in the kitchen with a grandmother as the poem tonally becomes a little bit darker and a little bit darker. Always, though, in the end, suggesting that it's moving around in circles, that we begin with drawing a house, and at the end, the girl draws another house. Makes me wonder what's happened I, it, to the girl. She, we don't get offered much. We don't get offered anything but the scene itself, um, a scene that's covered by, colored by tears and child in this repeated house. I don't know what to say about the poem. I don't know how to interpret it. I don't think it's a poem that's asking us to interpret it necessarily. I think it's a poem that's asking us to participate in the feelings that it presents. It's a poem that feels more tonal than anything, though it is true that Elizabeth Bishop did spend much of her childhood with a grandmother after the um, death of her father and then the subsequent loss of her mother. Um, so maybe the poem is thinking about how memory works, how we remember our childhood and how we remember our childhood often on a loop, again, beginning with the drawing of the house and ending with the drawing of a house colored by tears. One of the things I would note from this poem also, not only that the end words are really, are beautifully chosen and the repetition, I think when you first hear it, you, you don't, you don't even hear the repetition necessarily all that much um, unless we call attention to it. Part of the way that she does this and part of the things you should think about while you're writing your Sestina is that most of these lines are in jammed. That is, most of these lines do not end in punctuation. The words grandmother, stove, tears, almanac, child, and house don't shout at us because largely Elizabeth Bishop is encouraging us not to stop and pause uh, after, we, after we encounter them. We're supposed to read right over them. But secretly, while the grandmother busies herself about the stove, the little moons fall down like tears from between the pages of the almanac into the, into the flower garden the child has carefully placed in the front of the house. There's only one end stop line in that stanza. And because of that, the repeated words feel, I think, effortless, effortlessly woven into the poem. If she had ended each of these lines with a comma or a period, we would get that feeling of the poem arrowing towards those end, end words and then stopping there and taking a breath while the poor poet who's writing this damn thing has to think of another line that she can arrow towards and another word that she can end on. So hint, and one hint also is to think, well, how can I jam these lines? How can I make these end words function in the middle of sentences, not um, immediately followed by grammatical pauses? Another thing to think about, and one of the things I've noticed about Sistinas that aren't working is that they tend to have really good first stanzas, pretty good second stanzas, and then the lines get longer and longer and longer so that a poem that might begin with a roughly 10 syllable line count is up to a 20 syllable line count at the end. And of course, the reason for this is that the poor poet is trying to come up with yet another way to hit that end word. And she's trying to add more and more words to get there because more and more words feel needed because how do you, have any economy of language and also hit these same words over and over again, keeping them interesting. So if you see that happen in Tears Sestina, I think that might be a suggested point of revision. Okay, I wanted to look at a Sestina, read one out loud, tell you how it works, um, in case that's what you want to do. Um, I sent you a couple others also, so take a look at those. Okay, what's a villanelle? Like a Sestina? A villanelle also depends on a kind of diabolical um, series of repetitions. But in the case of the villanelle, the repetitions are of complete lines. Now, as I just said with the Sestina, if you're gonna have to repeat these words over and over and over again, you're gonna have to keep them interesting. And one way to keep them interesting is to pick words that have many functions, right? That can mean different things in different contexts. You know, if you pick the word grapefruit in your Sestina, man, you are stuck with that grapefruit all the way through the poem. Again, if you pick the word blue, you have a little bit more to work with and your reader doesn't think, oh my God, here comes this grapefruit again rolling up to me. The same applies to villanelles, though we are repeating entire lines. The trick of the villanelle is to make 
the repeated lines mean something a little different each time we encounter them, right? Or if not mean something different, become more and more, make perhaps emphatic each time we, we encounter them. Um, bad sestinas are boring because we see the words come and we're waiting for them. Bad villanelles become boring for the exact same reason. Ah, oh, here's this repeated line again. Because it seems to mean the same thing just not a minute ago, but he's going to tell it to me anyway. That's how a bad villanelle feels. So your job is to make the lines mean something a little different each time we get there. Now, one way to do it is to change the lines a little bit. I'm going to look at a bishop poem and she changes the lines a little bit. That's strictly speaking, um, not what a villanelle would do. Strictly speaking, it would repeat the line exactly. But good writers realize that following strict rules at the expense of good poetry is probably a bad idea. Um, Bishop was certainly a great poet, and she certainly plays around a little bit. Um, so that's one way to do it, is to vary your lines a little bit. Another is obviously to vary the context. That is, each repeated line exists in a separate stanza. So if the line's not going to change, the stanza's going to have to change things. So we're talking about a one, two, three, four, five, six stanza poem, right? So that's many opportunities to change things. Again, you're going to have a really hard time writing a narrative villanelle. Things just don't happen in villanelles. Things repeat in villanelles, so it's hard to make narrative progress. Things repeat, again, the suggestion of the villanelle is often also an obsessed mind, a mind that's going around and around that keeps returning to these same words. Um, but to keep it interesting, we can't merely do that. The stakes have to change. Okay, here's roughly how a villanelle works. Villano works this way. Again, as of the Sestina, your first stanza is going to predict how the rest of the poem is going to have to work. Your first stanza has three lines. Remember, that's a tercet of iambic pentameter, ideally, but again, you know, do it the way you want to do it. Line one is going to have rhyme A. Line two is going to have rhyme B. And line three is going to have rhyme A. Now there are only two rhymes in a villanelle, A and B. So when you pick, when you pick your lines, you have to pick words that you can get a whole lot of rhymes for, okay? You can't pick, again, I don't know, grapefruit. You're going to have a hard time finding a whole lot of rhymes with grapefruit. You're going to have to pick something that you can actually rhyme over and over again. For instance, in this poem by um, Sylvia Plath, the opening, opening three lines are, I shut my eyes and all the world drops dead. I lift my lids and all is born again. I think I made you up inside my head. Because that's her opening three lines of her villanelle, she's gonna have to use the line, she's gonna have to use the rhymes dead and head over and over again. She goes dead, head, red, bed, fade. Okay, that's a little, a little off. Said, instead. Okay, those are her rhymes there. Her B rhyme is again, I lift my lids and all is born again. She's got to do that over and over again too. Again, in, insane, men, name, again. Okay, she played a little bit loose too, but you know, you're being asked to come up with six separate rhymes. It's gonna be hard to do. Okay, so you got line one, rhyme A, line two, rhyme B, line three, rhyme A. No. Line one and line three are repeated lines. And I've sent you a map of how that works. So take a look at it. But you'll see that the third line of every tercet after that is either going to be a complete rewriting of line one or line two. Until the very end, when, or uh, uh, line one or line three, until the very end when line one and line three come together. At the very end, we have for a, a quatrain, a four-line stanza, where we have a first line, which is rhyme A, a second rhyme, which is line B, which you will write yourself, and then lines one and two from the first stanza are repeated there, but right next to each other. So what was separated by a line comes together in the end. That's also the trick. You have to write a line one and a line three in stanza one that can also function right next to each other as a final couplet, not unlike the final couplet in a Shakespearean sonnet. Okay, you can see why these are maddening and difficult. I'm going to read you one. 
This is a poem called One Art, also by Elizabeth Bishop. It's a great poem. Um, she was a famous reviser, and this is a poem she famously revised over and over and over again. Um, the last line, I can't remember how many times she revised it, but some 40, 50 times, I can't remember. Um, I know that the poem had, and originally had lots of references to blue eyes in it. Um, it was a poem initially pretty directly about um, her lover, whose name was Alice, who rejected her, and also about a previous lover named Lata, who killed herself, I think around that same time. So those are the background things that are informing the poem, but Elizabeth Bishop um, assiduously removed them from the poem as she revised. So it becomes a much more abstract poem about losing. But I think it's helpful to have that little background information in your mind that what's been lost in the poem or the motivation, the motivation that created this poem about losing is about losing something significant, a lover to rejection or death. Um, but that's the background of the poem. I think it becomes apparent by the end anyway. So one art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day. Accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, Places and names and where it was you meant to travel, none of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch. And look, my last, or next to last, of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster. Some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you. The joking voice, a gesture I love. I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master. Though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Where Tercestina, I'd argue, has a sort of a circular momentum. This one has a very straightforward momentum. We move from little things, right? Keys, um, an hour badly spent, um, up to increasingly larger things, right? Names, places we meant to travel, my mother's watch, things are getting larger and larger, two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, continents, they're getting larger and larger, but they're always pointed in that forward momentum to this phrase, even losing you. She doesn't tell us the nature of that loss, whether it's to death or rejection or perhaps a lost friendship, you can fill it in. But obviously given the progression of these things, the loss of the you is certainly larger than the loss of a continent, right? So it's a pretty, a, a pretty large loss. And when sense is then in the poem, somebody telling herself, look, I can handle this. It's art of losing isn't hard to master. Um, and offering all of these things as if they're on the same playing field when we know because they increase as we go through that they're not. That losing you is clearly harder than losing the car keys, right? That is losing you might indeed be very hard to master. She offers us that at the very ending when she brings lines one and three of the first stanza together, the very end, the art of losing is not too hard to master. So there's a change there. She says at the beginning, it isn't hard to master. But she says it's not too hard to master, which seems to me to be a qualitative difference. This is not too hard to master, but for whom? Is it maybe still too hard for the speaker? Has she been trying to soothe herself and then at this point begun to realize that this self self-soothing or self-encouragement hasn't actually worked. I don't know, the next line suggests it. Though it may look like, write it, like disaster. The question for me is, what does the it refer to there? Does the it refer to like disaster? 
if we're told to write it, the words like disaster, then okay. It might be a disaster, but it's probably not. It's probably like disaster, which is to say that we can we can get over something that's like disaster. Or is the it, write it, does that refer to just the word disaster? If it refers to the word disaster, then I think it suggests that the art of losing is actually hard, maybe impossible to master. That the poem's realization in its final word is disaster. That that's the thought that she leaves us with, which is to say that she hasn't gotten over it. And you know what? Of course she hasn't gotten over it. Of course she hasn't gotten over it. You know how you know? Because the person who is offering us this poem, the speaker in this poem, has constructed this incredibly elaborate architecture, <laughs> this incredibly difficult poem to write, and has offered it to us and said, look, I'm over it. Nobody who constructs this is over anything. Um, the fact of the poem's existence, I think, undercuts the initial statement of the poem that the art of losing is an art to master. It isn't so hard to master. Why, why is it being offered to us in such an impossible verse form to write? It's a terrific, terrific poem. Um, it has a ironic wink in it, but it also has, I think, wells of enormous feeling. Okay. Those are Villanelles and Sestinas. Um, good luck with them. If you want to try something else, Take a look at the fossil. I began the semester with y'all by looking at Emily Dickinson, so I thought, since we're kind of coming to an end here, um, we'd look at Emily Dickinson again. And um, to think about the meter that Emily Dickinson likes to employ, um, she employed it a great deal. It's called the common meter. Um, you might remember that from class number one, also known as the hymn meter, um, and we had said that it was the meter of many Protestant hymns. It's iambic, that is, it makes use of iams, weak, strong, weak, strong, I'm sure you know what that is by now, I know we've been over it a lot in class, but its beat count alternates from line to line. Beat count in line one is four, beat count in line two is three. So it's iambic tetrameter followed by iambic trimeter, followed by tetrameter, followed by trimeter. That's ballad stanza. Um, you know you're in ballad stanza, remember this when you can sing it to the tune of Gilligan's Island? Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Carriage hell, but just ourselves and immortality. I think that was the poem that we looked at a long time ago. Um, but that four beat, three beat, four beat, three beat construction is called common meter or hymn meter. Um, it also has a rhyme scheme. It goes line one rhymes with nothing, line two rhymes with line four, and line three rhymes with nothing. So they're quatrains going X. A, X, A, where X is an unrhymed N-word. Okay. I think that's what you need to know about this. Um, we'll just look at this one. It's called I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry, and breaths were gathering firm for that last onset, when the king be witnessed in the room. I willed my keepsake signed away, what portion of me be assignable. And then it was, there interposed a fly, with blue, uncertain, stumbling buzz, between the light and me, and then the windows failed, and then I could not see to see. an amazing poem. It's a poem that I often begin semesters with um, because to my thinking it's the most perfect poem I have encountered in my life. Um, it's the most perfect poem I've ever encountered um, and it's a really complicated one because like so much of Emily Dickinson she begins 
always in a kind of uncertainty. We don't know what's happened. We don't know where we are. A lot of options are offered to us. When she says, I heard a fly buzz when I died, we don't know whether the death is literal or figurative initially. We don't know if it's about an emotional death or a literal death. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. It's quiet in the room. For sure, it's quiet like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. What's suggested there? Is that the silence between two thunderbolts or something like that? That, that sort of eerie silence that we get? Or she uses the word heaves here, which is an unusual word. It's the word you want to look at. Um, maybe she means um, between two breaths, between the heaving of one breath, the heave of one breath and the heave of another breath. It's the sense between that. We are in the room where somebody appears to be recollecting her own death. So that makes sense that her recollection um, might be of the silence between her own breathing. Um, maybe it's the silence between two breaths, which is to say a couple of seconds. And that's the amount of time this poem that elapses in this poem or maybe the silence is between one breath and the next breath that never comes in which case an eternity elapses it's a real typical emily dickens thing to do is to sort of bend your mind with a meditation both on a short time and on eternity simultaneously you'll remember that other poem that we looked at we said the horse's heads were toward eternity um that poem too had that kind of that kind of thought at its core so anyway Stanza 1 offers us a lot. It seems as though the poem is told from beyond the grave. There is a tradition for that. A lot of poems are told from beyond the grave, um, while beginning with the Odyssey and, some, and at some points in the Odyssey. Um, so it's told from beyond the grave. The um, speaker rec recollects her own death and offers us this idea of heaves of storm. The eyes around, she tells us, had wrung them dry. What does that mean? eyes around had wrung them dry. Does that mean the eyes had cried themselves out so much that they had no, had no more tears in them? I think that's possible. But to wring something dry also feels violent to me. Maybe violent crying, but I could wring you dry with my eyes, right? I don't know, I'm bad at that. I'm basically a nice guy. But when I get mad enough, I might wring somebody dry with my eyes. I don't know if that's an entirely uh, clearly a statement about crying. I think as with much of Dickinson, both are sort of true. We don't know if these are honest mourners or if there's something else going on. And breaths were gathering firm, she says, for that last onset when the king be witnessed in the room. Oh, well, we know what's happening there, right? People are gathering their breaths for that last moment when the king, when God, right? God comes down and he's witnessed in the room, right? Why does God come after you die? Well, he comes to tell you whether you're a lamb or a goat, I think. Right, okay. It's where God's hopefully going to come. Of course, he never does. I willed my keepsake, signed away what portion of me be assignable, she says. And then it was, there interposed a fly. Okay, she sold everything away except for her soul. Keeping that portion for God, right? And instead of God, a fly interposes with blue, uncertain, stumbling buzz between the light and me and then the windows fail, and then I could not see to see. I don't know if the windows that fail here are as the windows outside of the room, or inside of the room, right? It's the 19th century. Light comes through those windows. The fly, we're told, is between the light and her, and the windows fail. For if the windows failing is a way of talking about her own death, the eyes being the windows to the soul, maybe that those have failed. It's unclear. I think the hook you can't hang your coat on in this poem, though, is what the fly means to you. Because a lot of people have offered a lot of readings on what this fly means. In my lifetime, I can think of a few. First is that the fly is God. She just doesn't know it, right? The fly is God stumbling across that window between the light and her, between the sun coming through the window and the window and herself. You know, that would make sense. Transcendentalism was happening when she wrote this poem. Part of the transcendental idea is that God exists simultaneously in all things, even the smallest fly, says Emerson, right? So 
this could be a poem in which the speaker is expecting a king to come, and that's what God does. He comes and judges us. But really, God has existed simultaneously in all living things and comes in the form of a fly to tell her this, but she doesn't understand it. Okay. Option number two, of course, is she's dead. But we don't know how much time has passed, as we pointed out in the first stanza. How, many, how much time happens between these heaves of storm, right? And dead flesh does attract flies. So maybe this isn't a theological poem at all in the way we thought it was. It wasn't when we were trying to understand who God is. Oh, it might be a fly. Um, maybe it's a poem about decay. That is, we expect God to come and judge us. But the fact is, there's only a decay that attracts a fly, not death that attracts a maybe benevolent God. That could be the case, too. I'll offer you those two, and I'll know that you probably have three or four others you can think of. Because finally, I think what this poem tells us is, I don't know what happens after you die. You know, maybe there's only decay. Maybe there is God. Maybe there is an afterlife. Maybe there's a kind of a limbo in which this voice speaks. I don't really know. The point of the poem is not to answer your questions about whether God exists and what happens after you die, but to offer possibilities. I remember a student once pointed out that Satan is often called Lord of the Flies. Maybe those people are wringing each other dry for a reason. Maybe she hasn't been such a good person. Maybe the other fly is Satan. Okay, um, that sounds fine too. But structurally, we said the poem is in common meter, hymn meter. I know we've talked about this earlier too. Structurally, the poem is participating in the tradition of the hymn. And that makes it interesting because this seems to me to be a hymn that doesn't do what hymns normally do. Normally hymns express faith in God. This one doesn't do that. This one says, I don't know if there's a God. I don't know. I don't know. There are lots of possibilities here. And you can track that discomfort within the hymn meter through the rhyme, which gets more and more um, unsettling as the poem progresses. Initially, the rhyme is a room and storm. It's a slant rhyme. And as we've said in class many times, slant rhyme can be unsettling. Firm and room are the next two rhymes. Those are even more slanty, even further apart. Next stanza, bee and fly. I would argue that's hardly a rhyme at all. Only at the ending do we get me and see between the light and me, and then the windows failed, and then I could not see to see. Here, the poem seems to end on a happy note. It clicks shut like a nice box. The rhyme is perfect. I think it's up for you to you to decide whether that nice note at the end suggests that a conclusion has been reached, or if that's ironic. No conclusion has been reached at all. And that nice little neat ending is a little wink from Emily Dickinson saying it feels like a nice ending, but it isn't. I think we saw a little of that when we looked at a poem by Anne Bradstreet earlier this semester as well. Anyway, okay, those are three forms that you might choose to write in. Common meter, Sestina, Villanelle. I wanted to finally think about one last thing. Um, here, we've looked at a lot of verse forms this semester. We've talked about a lot of different meters. Um, Forgive me if I've repeated myself. I know we did actually discuss this poem a little bit earlier. But I wanted to talk finally about something I promised I'd talk about. I mentioned it about six classes ago. And I said we'd return to it in the end because it's an important thing to think about in the end. And it is this idea that Paul Fussell brings up um, in the reading we were supposed to do for whenever, um, since we're in coronavirus time and sometime we were supposed to do it. Um, about being conventional. Um, I know you're all poets, and I know because you're all poets that we all, all of us in the poet tribe, like to think of ourselves as being unconventional, right? Um, you know, our friends are bankers and, oh, I don't know, lawyers and teachers, but we're poets, we're unconventional. Um, I think one of the most important ideas that Paul Fussell can impart to you in the reading is that you're entirely conventional if you're a poet. Poems are conventional. All poems are conventional. If it's not, if an, an unconventional poem is a contradiction in itself. And here's why. All art is conventional to begin with. It's easier, I think, to talk about other art forms before before we get into poetry. Um, so I'm gonna paraphrase a little fussel here for you and I'm gonna add some of my own stuff. Let's put it this way. Sculpture 
might attempt to create a reasonable facsimile of life. We go to the art museum and we look at a sculpture and we can say, wow, that looks like the goddess Diana, or that looks like, oh, I don't know, my friend Joan or something like that. Um, we're not offended or angry at the sculpture when we realize that it is made out of stone. Because one of the conventions of sculpture is that it might be made out of stone. It might be made out of marble. So we're not shocked to find that it is made out of marble. We look at a painting and it's a painting of a landscape and it recedes into the distance. And far in the back is, I don't know, a castle. Way in the background and the foreground is, I don't know, a grapefruit. When we reach up and touch the painting when the museum guard isn't looking, we are not angry to realize that the painting is flat and that that illusion of distance has been created by making the castle look smaller than the grapefruit, at least in actual measurable size on the canvas, because one of the conventions of painting is that we make things in the distance smaller than we paint them to things in the foreground, right? That's a convention of painting. Um, we walk around the back of the painting and we realize we can't see the grapefruit anymore and we can't see the castle. We're not angry at the painting because one of the conventions of painting is that it's on a two-dimensional surface and it faces one direction. You can't walk around the back of it, right? If we were to walk around the back of the painting and say, look, I can't see the stuff on the back of the painting, this thing isn't adhering to the rules, we're basically judging the painting for not adhering to the rules of sculpture, right? The conventions of sculpture are different from the conventions of painting. Now, poetry also has conventions. All of poetry is conventional, right? And we've been talking all semester about what those conventions are. Those conventions of poetry are meter, if not meter, rhythm, stanza, line, line break, white space, descriptions of image, words, rhetorical organization, poetic architecture, coherence, right? All of those and much more, all these things we've talked about all semester are the conventions of poetry. When you write a poem, if you want to keep your audience happy, you have to participate in the conventions. You don't have to participate in all of the conventions. You can write a poem that doesn't rhyme. Of course you can. But no matter what, you're going to be participating in the conventions of poetry or you're not going to be writing a poem. Convention is not imported from outside and laid over art. Convention are inseparable elements of art. And all semester long, We've been talking about conventions. You don't really have a choice if you're writing poetry. You are being conventional. I'm gonna have more wine while I think about this. Another way of saying it is that the sources of the conventions are public spaces. They're, hi they're history. When somebody says to you, all poems are made up of other poems, <laughs> They're not saying that you have to cut up other poems and glue them on the page and offer them as your poem, but they're saying that the great history of poetry, of all poems that have preceded us, have also established the conventions of poetry that you as a poet are participating in. You don't really have any kind of a choice, but it's really helpful to know what they are. Or when Harry Levin says, private convention, a private convention is like a prefabricated myth. It's a contradiction in terms. A myth is a belief shared by a lot of people. Conventions in poetry, the conventions of poetry are the conventions that we all share, that we all bring from our place in history into a poem. And we all participate in when we're writing poems and we participate in them when we're reading poems. Maybe another way of thinking about it is this. We talk a lot about being real in poems. We talk a lot about how we're reading short stories and saying, oh, that was a realistic fiction. And that other thing was, that other story I read, that was not realistic fiction. I mean, that's sort of a trou troubling, um, at least, and bogus at best position to take, at least position to take without thinking about it a little bit. And here's, here's how I know. A long time ago, um, before I realized I could get sued for this, I used to ask my undergraduate students to go secretly tape record conversations 
that they could hear, I don't know, in their dorm room or wherever, and then type them up and bring them to class, right? And when we would read those conversations out loud, they didn't make any sense at all. And I would say, well, why doesn't this make any sense? You know, and they would say, well, you can't really see the hand gestures. You, you had to be there to understand what was going on. You know, the actual transcript, it's, as, as art, it's pretty terrible. I can't even tell what they're talking about a lot. They're, I don't know. Um, and I would say, well, okay, um, how can we make this better? Can we turn this into really good dialogue? And we'd rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, and we'd add a lot of tension and a lot of voice and sort of characterization, and they would we would have people say things that, was, that were exciting, that we'd never normally say in regular life. And eventually what we were doing is we were creating a realistic dialogue, something we would call realistic dialogue, out of what was actually real dialogue, which is an interesting thing to say. We say that the more, in, in this case, dialogue appeared realistic the more we worked to make it appear realistic the more we moved away from what was actually real and i think this too speaks to the idea of convention that there are certain conventions of fictional dialogue that authors make use of right in order to create a semblance of realistic dialogue but weirdly in order to make realistic dialogue you have to move further and further away from actual real dialogue to do it right so i think it's a perfect thinking also about convention that that um, that convention exists for a um, convention in poetry exists for us to create a positive experience out of words, right? When I say that, and, and, and out of thoughts, when I say a free verse poem, for instance, mimics thought, part of its mimicry of thought is moving it as far away from actual thought as possible in order to make it interesting through the use of line break, white space, stanza break, all those suggestions of unarticulated thought before thought bursts into articulation, right? All of those things are not actually true to thought, but would create the illusion of thought through the conventions of poetry in order to create what feels like real thought, even as it moves further and further away from thought. All right, it's a really complicated idea. What I really wanna to get to here is that this whole class has been about conventions. I haven't really used the word a lot, but that's what the class has been about, that there are deep conventions in poetry. They're different from the conventions of sculpture and painting, and movie making and all other kind of art making. They're uniquely suited to poetry. And part of the job of this semester has been to learn how to deploy some of those effectively, to use them to create the illusion of a complex and interesting mind, or to create the illusion of a complex and exciting and um, performative speaker. And with that, I'm going to end this lecture for tonight. I'm signing off. I hope you all write great villanelles, great sestinas, great poems, and common meter, or however you want to choose. And I'm looking forward to talking to you all on the phone um, in the coming days. Bye.